Oh my, this is very exciting. I have been wanting to talk to this man for quite some time. To be honest, I kind of kept my distance. I wasn't sure how it would go. I do think we have a lot in common. Of course, we're both MOT, members of the same tribe. He, in my opinion is the best damn pro wrestler in the game today. I know he doesn't like the term heel. He's the best heel, dare I say, in the game as well. He is on fire. He's one of the faces of all elite wrestling. He's one of the four pillars of AEW. He's the salt of the earth. He's the one and only Maxwell Jacob Friedman on the program today. MJF, how How are are you? you? Tremendous job. I'm just going to take it from here as far as the intro goes. You did okay. It was a little mid. It was a little mid. Mm-hmm. You did okay, though, so I'm just going to take it from here. Ladies and gentlemen, just in case you are deaf, dumb, blind, stupid, or since you're listening to this and watching this interview, maybe a little poor, my name is Maxwell Jacob Freeman. I am the youngest and fastest rising star in the history of professional wrestling. I am the three-time beautiful Dynamite Diamond Ring champion, and I also beat CM Punk twice in Chicago and just costed that no good trader piece of shit Wardlow his TNT title shot. And wow. I'm better than you and you know. There you yeah, go. Amen. That's how it's done, Ariel. You did solid, like I said. A little mid, but it was good. It was good. Well, this is an honor. It's great to talk to you, my friend. You are on fire. Uh, happy birthday, by the way. Belated oh, birthday, 26. Would you have ever believed at just 26 years young, that you'd get a chance to talk to Ariel Hawani. I mean, this feels like a big deal in your career. <laughs> that's very cute. That's very was that cute. good? Was that good? I mean, uh, was that... That was, yes, yeah, yeah, that tickled me. That was very good. I like when I like when pores such as yourself have a little bit of a sense of humor. That's great. Thank you. By the um, way, is that a is that a library behind you? What's going yes, on? I've wow. read all of them. Many. Oh, I'm sure. Many leather bound books. I like. That's it. right. Like that's it. right. Okay. Uh, th- this this. Uh, this library is as real as the Burberry scarf that you wear. Sir, now hold on a second. Ariel, yeah. you're getting off on the right foot. <laughs> Maybe come for you, okay? Right full rise. This yeah. is a real pristine vintage Burberry. I only rock mage. You know what mage stands for? Major. Major. Correct yeah. mundo. All right? I only rock mage clothing, and that's Burberry at its finest. Shout Sir. out to the great... Uh, Dipperstein, I believe, uh, coined the My term. boy Dip. Yeah. Uh, one of my best friends in the whole wide world. Uh, how many of those do you own, by the way? Oh, my God. I would say I've got probably around the same amount of Burberry scarves as you do books behind you there. Wow. Okay. Being completely honest. I got ones for specific occasions. I got uh, specific colors for specific holidays. Normally, I'm a brown guy. Also, occasionally, I got Burberry ties, but... It's really all dependent on the situation and the scenario. When did the uh, idea start to, to come out wearing that? Well, it's just the best brand known to man, and it fits me very clearly. Uh, if you're from Long Island, I'm sure, which, you know, I know you are. I know um, your uh, shitty Jewy pro- producer is. <laughs> and you would know that people from Long Island, we rock the burb. It's what we rock. It might as well be the LI flag. You see burb left and right. And uh, yeah, I mean, I've been rocking burb my whole life. Uh, for the record, though, I am not from Long Island, proudly not from Long Island. Where are I'm, you from? I am Canadian, Maxwell. I mean, I feel like you should have done a bit of homework, a little no, research like no, I did I don't think you're Canadian. Of you. I don't think I'm you're actually Canadian. a dual citizen. I just became an American citizen last week, but How proud you, can you prove Montrealer. It? Can you prove it? Uh, yes, I have the certificate of naturalization right over there, but I am okay. born and raised in Montreal, Quebec, Canada, now you living in the U.S. Papers, but it is what it is. Now, you said you came here illegally? No, no, no. <laughs> Uh, all right. People look into that after this interview. So, okay, a lot to talk about. Uh, I, I do, I do want to kind of start at the beginning because your story is a fascinating one. And in fact, I stumbled upon an amazing piece of footage of young Max on the Rosie O'Donnell show way back when you're sitting there. I mean, you, how old were you when you were a guest on her program? Maybe five, that's, six? That's gank. I think I was five. I think I was five when that You were five. Out. She stole and, money. But we can get into that if you want to. It's, it's really all dependent on how much time we have, Ariel. Uh, she, uh, I guess she found out about you because you did this sort of opera version of You Are My yeah. Sunshine. She brought you yeah. on the program. You said you wanted to be the first opera singer slash pro wrestler. How did you end up on the program? That's a really big deal. And a great find all these years later, you did become the pro wrestler. Yeah. Well, uh, the opera thing I just said because I was told to by the writing team of Rosie's. The, the wrestling thing, I kind of just shot that in there. So what had happened was, I have an angelic voice. I have a voice of an angel. I don't know if you're aware of this, Ariel. I am an all-state tenor two in choir. I was the leader of the all-male acapella group known as the Acapellas. 
Um, now at that time at five, I was already a much better singer than everybody else. I mean, I'm a prodigy at practically everything. And what had happened was, is my mom had recorded me, recorded me singing and she sent it to Rosie O'Donnell. And Rosie said, my God, this kid, he's got everything. He's wildly attractive, wildly modest, as we both know, and an incredible singer. So that's how I got on the show. Unfortunately, Rosie, uh, she was supposed to send me quite a large check for my appearance and she forgot, but I got to meet Britney Spears in the back, you know, pre going absolutely insane and shaving her head bald. So that was interesting. She was also a guest on that episode. She was a guest on that episode. Yeah. Oh, wow. You that out. Yeah. She, she do you remember me meeting her? I do. She kissed me on the cheek and she told me I was cute and I told her she was, you know, you know, she, she was okay. She had, she was kind of chubbing it up at that point. A little, little weight, just a little bit of water weight more than she needed. Uh, how did that even resurface? Like who unearthed that footage? I wish I knew, you know, a lot of these fans out there, they, they want to know who the real MJF is. Who's the real Maxwell Jacob Friedman. And the funny thing is the more they dig, the more they realize that this is me. Um, but yeah, I suppose some absolute freaking lunatic um, found that video and then posted it online. And it just absolutely, it went mage. I mean, it was all over the place. Um, in that clip, she uh, gives you a gift certificate to WWF New York, which is also uh, no longer around. Another story. So it had closed huh. almost a week later. I was so excited to go. Obviously, to this day, I'm a huge WWE fan. They know they're a huge fan of me, um, as I've as I've been told and as I've read. And um, I mean, so I was so excited. And then a week later, when I was supposed to go, it had completely closed down. So, wow. Yeah. So you never went. No, shot right to the heart, man. I never got to go, never got to attend. So. How did you get introduced to pro wrestling? So the way I got introduced to pro wrestling was I was, I believe, four at the time, but I do remember this very vividly. I was over my uncle's house. It was a family little, you know, get together at his beautiful, luxurious home. And I'm sitting down and on the TV, it was a Friday night. So there was SmackDown. I didn't know it was SmackDown at the time. And I remember I'm getting a glimpse of what this stuff is. And I'm just in absolute awe by what's going on. And, you know, after the fact, but I didn't remember exactly what I was watching. I was just in awe of these, you know, monstrous Titans. And I remember looking at my father as we went home and I was like, I just need to see more of this. So he took me to a Hollywood video when I was very young and I grabbed just a bunch of, you know, DVDs. And there was one guy in particular who looked like a zombie and his hand was reaching out in the front. At the time, I didn't know it was The Undertaker. So I bring that home and I, I put in the DVD and I read the back and on the back, it says Hell in a Cell match. And I go, that sounds interesting. The rest of them didn't have any, you know, so all right, I watched that. So the first match I ever watched, I think I was like four turning five was was mankind versus the undertaker in a hell in a cell match and i was wow. absolutely hooked wow so, not a not a bad match to start off with and so are you then like a hardcore like are you watching everything i mean obviously you're very young but watching everything and, and luckily i was you know i was the born in the age of youtube so i was able to get my hands on anything and everything and you know a lot of my friends were just watching wwe but what i what i fell into was watching the throwback stuff so i'll never forget going on youtube and there's this guy He's chewing gum and he's got his, you know, feet on a desk and he's, he's looking at this guy who's a, supposed to be a host, you know, more research I do turns out that's Vincent McMahon and Roddy Piper and Piper's just chewing gum, talking all this shit. And I'm like, I can relate to this guy because I have the biggest mouth in the world. And here's this guy, he's making money off of just being himself. I'm in. And I was just so, so beyond hooked. And then I followed his entire career going in the annals, you know, just watching all of his stuff in Portland and then I found out about territory wrestling and I'm like, I'm like eight or nine and I'm watching Mid-South wrestling and AWA and Crockett. And I, I was just absolutely obsessed with that version of professional wrestling. Cause to me, that's the best professional wrestling. So. Why is it the best? It's the best. Cause you don't have a bunch of schmucks trying. Here's my issue with professional wrestling today. And here's why I stand out like no other. I feel like people are putting on a superhero costume before they go through the curtain. They are trying to be something they're not. They're trying to fool people into believing they're a star. The reason why the Territory Days was such a beautiful thing is because these, these men were themselves. They were men. 
You know, nobody had to tell Tully Blanchard what or how he was supposed to act when he walked through the curtain because he was Tully B. Nobody had to tell Flair to act. Nobody had to tell Piper how to act. Nobody had to tell Buddy Landell had to act. Rick Rude. These guys got it because they were just being themselves. It was authentic. It was as real as it got, just like I'm as real as it gets. And that's why, to me, that's the golden age of professional wrestling. And right now we're having a resurfacing of the golden age of professional wrestling. And I am leading that charge. You're so welcome. When you're- no, that, that was tremendous. Um, I appreciate your your love and respect for you know the good old days. Most kids your age growing up, they're watching you know Raw SmackDown. Uh, I understand you were a big quote unquote tape trader. Is that is that a thing that you partake in? So, so I didn't take I didn't partake in tape trading just because I had YouTube. Now if okay. there was if there was something I really really couldn't get my hands on, there were some websites off of like Reddit where you would find DVDs and you'd search out for it. But like I was not that was way before my time. Like I'm not as old as you are, Ariel. I'm not a fossil. So at that point, pretty much everything I wanted to see was on YouTube or daily motion. And, and your favorite growing up, correct me if I'm wrong, was Roddy Piper. 1 million percent still to this day, Roddy Piper outside of me. If, if I'm being honest, I'm better than Piper in Portland. I'm better than Bret Hart in Canada. Um, but growing up, yes, Piper was tremendous. Absolutely tremendous. Did you ever meet him? Never got to meet him. He passed away before I got to meet him. Um, but I'd, I'd like to think based on, you know, I had met, I'd met his daughter when she did that one shot for us. And she had told me that she thinks her father would have been a very big fan. And I'm inclined to agree. I mean, come on. So favorite Piper moment match. I mean, there's a lot, right? The coconut. I so mean, so much. Obviously my favorite Piper moment was the dog collar match against Valentine. Um, as far as to me, that was, again, we're talking realism. We're talking, we're talking as real as it gets because it was just like I am, you know, as much as I hate to admit it, I think that's why people are all emphatically so in love with watching me and CM Punk go at it as much as a dumb scumbag, nerdy, straight edge, you know, piece of trash as he is. They love seeing the two of us go at it because it reminds them of that, that dynamic, if you will. You told a story recently in the build up to the uh, the dog collar match with with Punk about being yeah. in high school. He cheated, by the way. I, I had the match completely won, and he cheated. But we can get into that later. Yeah, Come we on. can get into it. No problem. But I, you know, the the Jew boy stuff resonated with me as as sure. a Jew. You don't hear a lot of Jew talk in pro wrestling. Sure. Uh, yeah, well, you're and, very Jewy looking, so I, I, I can uh, see the nose. Got mercilessly just bullied. Actually, I was I was quite popular, but I I related to the kids who got picked on. And uh, the story you told was... I didn't mean was, to laugh at you when you said you're popular. I should have just internalized that and just laughed at you. Um, how, how real was that story? How truthful was that story? It was 110% real. Um, really? It's like everything, everything that comes out of my mouth is real. Uh, so what had occurred was, is I had tried out for the football team. Um, there was a lot of Gentiles, if you will, on the football team. I was one of only two Jews on the entire team. Because Jewish kids are supposed to be accountants, um, doctors, lawyers. We are not supposed to steer away from that and try to do contact sports. Um, so I, I, was, I was in a weird position. I tried out for the team. I was head and shoulders better than everybody else. Um, and I would go on to break every single school record in, in football defensively um, at my high school. But yeah, at the time, the kids were not a fan of the uh, quote unquote Jew boy taking their spot. So after another day of me having the worst day in school, because I have severe attention deficit and I was never able to concentrate no matter how hard I I tried, I was so stoked because I thought I was going to be able to make friends. And then all these kids rolled up on me, pun intended, with quarters, and they chucked them at me as hard as I could. Um, And I still I still had to stick around for the rest of the school day, which was brutal, just trying to hold it in and be, you know, just get through it. And then when I got home, I just cried my eyeballs out and then. I remembered everything was going to be okay because I got to see at my time, I didn't realize how much of a piece of shit he was, my hero at the uh, Hicksville Broadway Mall. So, and, and, and that was the exact same day? The exact same day. And he was doing what, like an autograph signing, CM Punk we're talking about? Yeah. He was doing an autograph signing, yeah. This was Friday night. He was on, at this point, he wasn't ECW champion yet, but I'm fairly certain he, he was getting close to winning that title. From And you are how old? Because... That picture that you posted, that's the same day? It was, yes. It was 2007. I believe it was 2007. I know I said it in the greatest promo of all time that night, but I'm just trying to remember now. I believe it was well, 2007. Because you look 12 in that picture, if not younger. I was 11. I was 11 you were years 11. old. 
Yeah. So, but, but you're saying you're trying out for the high school football team. I'm just trying to. So yes. So I connect. had tried out for the high school football team around, around that time. Sorry, pardon. Blah. I had tried out for, this is middle school now. I'm sorry. I'm 11 years old and I tried out this for the This is why I'm, a, you see, I'm trying to. So I'm, my apologies, I misspoke. I was talking about, I got my, my, all my wires crossed because when I was in high school, I had broken all those records. I was 11 years, and by then everybody loved me because let's face it, you, you were either getting on the train or you were going to get run over by the train. But yeah, so I was 11 years old. So this was, I don't remember what grade it would have been, but I believe I must've been in middle school because I'm out of park, you're out of elementary now. Cause I went to Parkway Elementary, but I went to Matlin Middle. So I believe this happened to me in Matlin Middle School. Okay. And Sorry. Sorry, with all with all the specifics, it's a lot of different specifics. No, yeah. listen, I, that's why I'm the journalist, and you're the uh, course, you know the course. meathead guy. Yeah, um, yeah. I, yeah. I follow the you know facts. Facts matter. Understood. There you go. Yeah. Um, yeah. What did you so stay the same exact day. I went home, and then we drove on over to Hicksville Broadway Mall, and I got my autograph. Do you remember what you said to him? I remember what he said to me, uh, which which makes me realize that he's he's all the more fake. Uh, just a horrible human being. But in that moment, he was pretending he was a good person. So I waited in line with my cousin, um, who at the time, we, we were not fans of each other. His name's Sammy. Now we get along great. But you know, your kids, you have your little rivalries going on. And he had a cane shirt on and he was in front of me. And we had waited on this line for hours. We finally get to the front and he looks at me and he goes, he's going to love me. And, and Sammy walks up to see him punk and he goes, you're my favorite wrestler. And Punk looks at him and goes, and why are you wearing a cane shirt? Which was the coolest moment ever. Cause right. he, you know, he got to, you know, cut a promo on my shitty cousin. And then I was next. And I looked at him cause at this point I'd already watched all of his IWA mid South, uh, mid South IWA, um, IWA stuff. And I had watched uh, all of his ring of honor stuff. So I flat out asked him, I said, coming from where you came from on the independent circuit. And I'm 11 at this point, I was a fucking genius. I go, coming from the independent circuit, how does it feel to know that you have a, a line of people that are waiting hours just to meet you when you used to like wrestle in like these dingy gymnasiums? And he stopped and he looked at me and he said, that's the most intelligent question anyone asked me all day. Wow. And I remember at the time how much that meant to me. Now I realize he was just saying that shit because he wanted to be Mr. Nice Guy when in reality he's scum of the earth, I'm salt of the earth. At what point does the dream of being a pro wrestler actually like start to come together for you? So if, if I'm being completely honest, I went to the first elimination chamber, um, Madison Square Garden. Don't ask me names and dates. I'm going to kill you at this point with all these, these dates questions. I feel like I'm <laughs> getting a light shined over my fucking I'm trying to I'm trying to put all the pieces together. I mean, this is yeah. great. This is like an old school RF video shoot interview. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You remember those? Or is that before your time? No, no, no. I've watched probably almost all of them, especially <laughs> New Jack versus Balls Mahoney with them just yelling at each other. That's that was great. tremendous. Um, yeah. Both dead. Uh, R.I.P. But I, um, oh boy, where was I? Would you ask me again? When Sorry. did it all start to come together for you? The dream of wanting to be a pro wrestler, elimination so chamber, you said. What had occurred was I went to Madison Square Garden as the first elimination chamber and Shawn Michaels had that shitty Dutch boy haircut with the brown doo-doo pants. <laughs> and so he would tell me I'm wrong. It's the truth. Whatever. Shawn, if, if you hear this, if you get offended, you and I both know I'm right. I'm sure you're a great guy. Whatever. Uh, so he hits the pose. And I'm looking around and everybody's standing up, right? And I look at my dad and even my dad's in awe. And he's not the easiest guy to, uh, you know, to get invested, you know? He's not the easiest guy to impress. And I think to myself, I can do this. Like, I know for a fact I can do this. And I tug my dad and I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to be a pro wrestler. And of course my dad giggled because, you know, I, I was growing up to be a five foot nine Jew boy from Plainview, Island, New York, five foot nine Jew boys from Plainview, Island, New York, especially ones with crippling ADD aren't meant to be professional wrestlers, but I defied all the odds because let's face it, I'm a goddamn prodigy. But yeah, that's the day I said to myself, oh, I'm, I'm going to be a pro wrestler. I don't know how old I was. Fucking Google it, assholes. Okay. <laughs> it was the first ever elimination. Paper. Not that hard. Uh, if you're able to find me in Rosie O'Donnell, I'm sure you can figure out how old I was when that went down. And of course, uh, the big turning point for you is when you're scrolling through Instagram, just sort of like mindlessly scrolling. You go through yeah. the wrestling classic. Yeah. You see that photo. Why did that photo mean so much to you? Punk shaking hands with uh, Brian Danielson. That's it when your me, life completely it changes. It made me livid. So I would have to go back. This is a part of the story I couldn't tell because in television, you only have so much time. Oh, this is uh, great. Exclusive? 
there's a little exclusive stuff. So what nice. had occurred was, is I had a full ride scholarship to play football. And Where? I go to University of Hartwick. So what had occurred was I had all these division one offers. They were offering me solid money, but not full ride. So my mom told me like, you're going to go to this D3 school because they're going to pay for your education entirely. I said, you're a fat whore, mom, whatever. So I go, <laughs> right? She's a bitch. Don't even get me started on her. So I go. And after a week, the head coach tells me, we want to start you. Now, as a freshman, I should have been absolutely over the moon elated. I didn't care. I was dead inside. I felt nothing, nothing. Because my whole entire life, all I wanted to be a pro re- was a pro wrestler. But then I see a guy who is the best in the world and he left. So why, why can I do it? That's where my brain went at the time, unfortunately. Then I realized I was 10 times better than him in the first place. So the coach tells me that I go back to my dorm and I'm scrolling on Instagram and I see that photo and I'm fucking livid. I'm livid because here's the guy again that made me question whether or not I was, I was supposed to follow my dreams. And I look to the guy to my right and I go, you know what? I'm out of here. I think I'm going to leave. And he goes, okay. And left the room. Weird reaction, right? He fucking narked on me because he wanted to be the middle linebacker at the time. He was another freshman vying for the same position. Wow. So I get called to the coach's office. The coach got his fat disgusting belly on top of the desk he's fucking got a huge dip in his lip and he looks at me and he goes i heard you want to leave and i go well this isn't exactly professional fat boy but yeah i'm trying to get out of here i'm just being honest with you and he goes well i can't have you do that and i go what's that supposed to mean he goes well i I think you're homesick and i was like i think you're dumb i don't know what's going on here i'm gonna go home and he's like no 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 i'm gonna assign you an accountability buddy i go an account of what in walks, I still, I'm friends with this guy on Facebook to this day, 6'6", 300 plus pound at the time. Now he's lost some weight. Offensive lineman named Sal Levante. And Sal followed me everywhere, man. Followed me everywhere. For two days, if I went to the bathroom, he waited outside. If I went to go eat at the chow hall, he was sitting right next to me. They literally were holding me hostage. When I told Tony Khan this story, he explained to me the litany of legalities that were crossed in the scenario in NCAA. It's just wildly illegal. So what I ended up doing was I waited till 2 a.m. in the morning. I grabbed the essentials. I got in my car. I put my key in the ignition. And I'm a religious man. I don't know if you are, Ariel. And I remember I stopped. I paused and I said, God, if you do not want me to leave this campus, give me a sign. I counted to 10 Mississippi. Nothing. Drove home. Rest is history. Wow. And, and how soon after that do you start training? Almost immediately after. So I go home and my two anxiety ridden Jewish parents are obviously cursing at me up a storm. What are you doing here? What are you nuts? You're going to be a gas station attendant if you don't graduate from college. And I'm just like, yeah, whatever, assholes. I'm going to be a pro wrestler. And I remember my dad looking at me. He's like, if you're going to do this, you only have a limited amount of time in my house to get it done. And you better give it 110% or you're out of here. And I said, don't worry about it. And uh, then I got very lucky because there's only a handful of reputable professional wrestling schools. There's plenty of professional wrestling schools, but there's only a handful of reputable ones. And I, you know, it was kismet. I go online, I go wrestling schools, Long Island. And I thought to myself, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to move to a different state probably. Right. And 15 minutes from my house in Hicksville, Long Island, a new school that had opened up maybe only five months prior, five months prior, create a pro wrestling run by Pat Buck and Kurt Hawkins. And yeah, I went right there. So how long after that, do you have your first match? Three months. Wow. So and this is me being blunt as shit. I, I took to it like a fish in water and it was so hysterical to me because I'm just a freak athlete and I just get shit right away. But I got the stuff at next, like it was a next different level because I was such a student of the game. I remember my trainers would say stuff and they'd be like, do that. And, I, and I'd do it right away. And everybody else would have difficulty. And then I'd be like, do you guys not watch? Do you not understand the mechanics of this? Like, everything came to me so easy. You know, as much as it would pain Brian Myers and Pat Buck to say, if you asked them, they'd tell you. You knew after a week what I was going to become. And it was so fast. And my first match, I was only three months in. And the match, I watched it back recently. It's on YouTube. Um, it's not easy to find um, but I, I believe it's on the Creative Pro YouTube. If, if it's not, it's on like a separate side link. Either way, if you can find it, you can find I'm sure you can. You, you, you fucking weirdos find everything. Um, it was a great match. Like it literally, I didn't, I didn't come across 
um, you know, scared or skittish. I cut a great promo before we even wrestled. It was a great match. So speaking of YouTube, yes. um, on YouTube, there is your tough enough application video. Yes, there yeah. is. Yes. yes. Uh, Trip wasn't smart enough. If you remember <laughs> the promo I cut. I did. Uh, I, I watched it recently, um, and it's it's amazing to watch. Now, how far into your career, you know, as as a budding wrestler? I was nineteen. You... I was nineteen years old at the time, so I was I was about a year in the biz, and maybe not even a year yet. Probably not even a year yet. I was right. nineteen, and I wasn't even a year in the biz. And I remember cutting this promo, sending it, and I thought to myself, nobody's cut a better promo than me. And I was a hundred percent right. Um, I ended up having the most views at the time of any of the applicants and I still didn't get in. And to this day, I just have a feeling that it might've rubbed certain people the wrong way, uh, the, with some of the verbiage I used in the promo, but I had the most views. I got through one casting call and then that was it. I didn't hear from them again, but if I'm being honest, like I said, everything happens for a reason. I think if I went there at that point in time, I would have been doing fucking rolls. You know what I mean? They, they wouldn't have understood what they had. Now, not only do they understand, but they're going to be unloading an absurd amount of money by 2024 just to hopefully get a sniff at getting MJF in their company. So, And I want to ask you about that in a moment, but um, just like ego-wise, like was, yeah. that, was, was it tough when you didn't no, get... No, no, no. To me, I just thought, oh, okay, so you guys are dumb. Got it. No problem. No problem. I've met the, I meet dumb people every day. In the, I meet dumb people everywhere, um, just dumb people. But then, you know, as I got older and I look back on it, I'm really glad I didn't get signed and I'm glad I didn't go on that show because A, I would have won. I mean, pretty sure I could have done better than ZZ. I think I would have been okay. Um, you know, so it, it is what it is. And they look back on it now. I'm sure they're fucking slapping themselves silly for it. Well, I, I know they are. And the, the interest for me in that company now is probably more so than anybody who's about to be a free agent. So that's, that's just the way the world works, man. That's business. Have you ever had a conversation with anyone from the McMahon family, Triple H, Pritchard? So, it's like anyone in well, a position Bruce of power Pritchard there. And me, this is a shoot. Bruce Pritchard and me, everything I say is a shoot. Bruce Pritchard okay. and me go way back. Um, when he was in MLW, he was one of the lead producers there. And I mean, he would watch me do promos. And I mean, he was floored by me absolutely enamored by me. I was the prettiest girl at the ball. And uh, we would just sit down, we'd shoot the shit. And I love Bruce. I think Bruce is a hell of a guy and has a hell of a mind. I think he produces incredible television. And so, yes, I've talked to Bruce multiple times. As far as how I've been reached out to, legally, it's not smart for me to answer that question. But what I can say emphatically is there's, a, there's an absurd amount of interest in me. Tony Khan knows that. Tony Khan claims he's not afraid of that. And that's good. So I hope you're not afraid to shell out a lot of fucking money. But even prior to signing with AEW. Oh God. Yeah. So I had, I had a decision to make there. Um, I was, I believe I was 22 at the time. I was either 21 turning 22 or I was 22. Uh, again, don't know. Don't kill me with the math. Um, but you know, I knew there was serious interest in me in WWE, but again, I thought to myself, are they going to let me be me? That's my biggest thing. Because I'm not fake. Everything about me is real. Are you going to let me do what I do best and let me be me? And then I got to talking to Tony Khan. I was linked up with him um, by, uh, by my good friend, Cody Rhodes. Hope you're doing good, buddy. And we talked for hours on end over the phone, me and my BFFTK, about Mid-South, about AWA, um, about Buddy Landell, about Butch Reed. And I immediately thought to myself, okay, this guy gets it and he gets me. And that's what was the most important thing to me. So at that point in my career, it was a no brainer. Now you bring me anywhere, I'm going to be a top guy in your promotion. So it doesn't really matter. But at that point, I needed to make sure I had the perfect launching off point in my career. Did you Does that think that makes sense, you, Ariel? Did that it makes total sense. Head? It's or a I beautiful can... story. Um, I love how, you know, he believed in you, you believed in him. It's an upstart company. Did you believe, though, you know, we're, we're, we're three years into this thing, that AEW would be as successful? Like, yes. honestly, you believe yes. that? This is honestly not happening God, yes. a little sooner than you thought? And if I'm being completely frank, and 
people can people can scoff if they want, but realistically, I'm the best right now healing the business, even though I despise that word. I'm salty earth. I don't agree with that at all. I'm a good guy. Okay. Um, but I knew going into it, if they had guys like me, Jungle Boy, Darby, Sammy, leading the charge for the next generation, and we had guys at the time like, you know, Chris Jericho, who's a household name, like Jim Ross, who's a household name, people were going to check us out. And once they got to see me, they were going to stick around. And that's been proven because I am one of the highest, actually scratch that, I am the highest minute for minute draw on average in AEW, specifically on Wednesday nights. Now, I guess you don't have to specify that because the war is over. Respectfully, we won. But yeah, so I knew what I was bringing to the table was special. I knew it hasn't been seen yet. And I knew it would also remind people of those, in fact, good old days. So I wasn't worried at all. I knew if you gave me the time and if you allowed me to do me, that I was going to draw. And I've proven that time and time again. We just had the either the, the most or the second highest most uh, pay-per-view uh, buys for this past pay-per-view at Revolution with me and Punk obviously being the most important match on the card. What do you think AEW is doing right, right now that WWE isn't doing? See, I think WWE is doing great. I love everything WWE is doing. I just think we're fresh and we have fresh faces that people haven't seen before. Uh, I think everything right now that Bruce Pritchard and Vince are putting out there is absolutely incredible. I love it. Um, I love NXT 2.0. I love Raw. I love SmackDown. I love what Roman's doing. I think Roman's putting out some great work. Paul Heyman, fellow member of the tribe, absolutely killing it. Um, Sorry about what's going on with Brock. You deserve better than that. I I think they're putting out a great product. Um, I think think the big differential is, quite frankly, is AEW has MJF. I think that's, that's the biggest difference maker you could possibly have. So... So you said earlier, you know, everything I say is is the truth. I actually feel like this is a promo right here. Like I actually no, feel- no, absolutely not, absolutely not. No, I genuinely, you, I you genuinely WWE love programming. NXT 2.0. It's great. It's what great. is great about it? It's great. I mean, honestly, there's so many charisma machines on that program. <laughs> there is. I don't know why you're laughing. I think it's a great show. And I, you know, they had a makeout competition this past Tuesday, gripping television. How can you not like a makeout competition? I mean, I, I practically had a makeup competition with that hot redhead a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if you saw that area. Um, but I mean, who doesn't like a good makeout set? So I'm, I'm enjoying it. I think Bruce is doing a hell of a job. And at the end of the day, you know, quite frankly, you know, there's a lot of guys there that are developing and they're trying to figure out who, who they are as, as human beings, not who they are as acts, but who they are as human beings. And, you know, it's fun to watch. You get to see these young guys develop and figure it out. Speaking so, of uh, Paul Heyman, have you ever met him? I have never met Paul Heyman. We, wow. we, we, have, we have texted, and we are both big fans of each other. Would you like to work with him one day? God, yeah, absolutely. I think that would be, that would be a match made in heaven. I think him and CM Punk was a little bit mid, but me and Paul Heyman, that would be mage for sure. I mean, that's huge. That's, that's huge. Uh, you mentioned Cody Rhodes. He was the one that introduced you to Tony yes, Khan. Yes, he introduced me to Tony Khan. How do you feel about him leaving AEW? I wish him the best of luck. I really do. I hope he, I hope he finds happiness, and I hope he makes a boatload of money. You know, um, do Have we had our issues in the past? Absolutely. Do I love him as a human being? Maybe not, but I respect him as a businessman. Look, this is the same guy who, you know, I whipped several times as I watched his wife cry and weep. Um, I'm not saying we're, we're buddies, you know? I'm not saying I like the guy, but what I am saying is I respect what he's doing as a businessman. And quite frankly, by 2024, if people have an issue with me leaving to go make real money, then me and him are going to be fighting on the same exact island. So are you what surprised is. that he decided to leave, that AEW was okay with him leaving, that, that ultimately- No, I'm not surprised because we-, we we have so many weapons and we have so many top guys in our promotion. Um, you know, the wheel's just going to keep on turning. Now, was Cody Rhodes a big, a big, big weapon in our arsenal? Absolutely. I think that's why I look forward to seeing what he as a weapon does, uh, you know, for the rest of his career. So uh, what, what do you say to the people who say they're bringing in AW, bringing in too many of the, you know, old WWE guys, they're getting away from what got them here, guys like you, 
guys like Sammy Darby. Guys like me, guys like me are drawing the highest numbers. Guys like me are on TV every week. Guys like Sammy Guevara just had the TNT title uh, for an incredible reign. As much as I hate his stupid face and the fact that he has to stick out his tongue, is that a tick? I don't understand what's going on there. Darby Allen is on TV weekly again. Another emo loser scumbag. Huge star in our programming. Jungle Boy is currently a tag team champion. So to those people, what I would say is that's a bad faith take. Now, are we bringing in professional wrestlers that have been in other quote unquote territories and companies? Yes. Just out of curiosity, smart Mark fan, are you aware that when you watched AWA and Mid-South and Atlantic, that all these guys didn't start in those promotions that were top guys? They're journeymen. We move around. We, we go where the money's at. And right now I'm where the money's at for me for now. So to those bad faith takes, because that's exactly what it is. It's bad faith takes. Professional wrestlers, we, we go where we feel we are going to be handled best and where we feel we're going to make the most money and where we feel we have an opportunity to become world champion. So if people want to come over here to go for, in my opinion, the most important world title in all of professional wrestling right now, the AEW world title, then how can you not respect that and understand that? So I get it. What do you make of WWE letting go of all these guys? It seems like every few months it's like, wow, they let this guy go, they let that guy go. You know, it's like whether it's uh, Bray Wyatt or 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 um, you know Keith Lee. I mean, it's just like every. What, do you guys sit back and be like, wow, what is going on over here? Do you just feel I that? Think, I think that's a moment where you have to look in the mirror and go, okay, it's sink or swim time. Am I as I am I as great as I think I am? Because if I am, I can go elsewhere and shove it to Vince and Triple H or whomever that decided to let me go. Correct or incorrect, Ariel? Mm -hmm. So Correct. again, let's go back to tough enough. They didn't want none of MJF at that point. Okay, here's the chip on my shoulder. I'm going to make you swallow it. And that's what I did. So these guys are all great talents. Um, I'm sure they're, you know, good dudes. Not that I'm really going to hang out with any of them. They're all kind of whores. But, you know, to each their own. If they're as good as they think they are, then they're going to make it, aren't they? Whether they go to New Japan, whether they go to Ring of Honor, which is now owned by us, whether they go to Impact Wrestling, uh, whether they go to the independent circuit and get huge. Look at Zack Ryder. Let me talk about Matt Cardona for a second. Another LI boy. He's killing it right now. Absolutely killing it right now. Do you think, do you think that when he got released, he sat down and went, oh, man, this isn't fair? No, he went for it. He attacked it. Now, is it a, is it a brutal inconvenience? Is it upsetting? Absolutely. And I, I feel for those guys. But now you got to pick yourself up and make something, make something of yourself all over again. Will you rise to the occasion? That's up to you. Uh, you've, you've referenced 2024. Is your contract up January 1st? Like when are you truly a free agent? January 1st, 2024. And you mentioned this a lot, which I appreciate uh, yeah. as someone who talked a lot. You know, I cover MMA for a living. Free sure. agency is a very interesting thing. Um, a lot of guys don't talk about this. A lot of guys don't mention this. They don't want to bite the hand that is currently feeding them. Why do you bring this up so much? So when you're as talented as over and as much of a draw as me, if I want to, I can bite off Tony Khan's fingers. Okay. He knows, he knows where his bread is buttered. And if that offends somebody in the locker room, which I know it does. Oh, well cry about it. Get more over than me. Oh wait, that's right. You can't because I'm literally the best talker in the history of the business. And one of the best wrestlers in the history of the business battle bell because i don't just spam moves like i'm in a video game no i make people feel something because i'm going out there to win i'm not going there out there to show off i'm not going out there to try to make sure that i get you know all these people talking about my star ratings no if that happens and it's a byproduct of what i do fantastic but i didn't get into this business to hit moves i got into this business to make money that's why i got into this business so that's why i'm not afraid to talk about when my contract is up January 1st, 2024. And I'm not afraid to stir that pot because it's a constant reminder of Tony Khan. Okay, I need to step my game up. And it's a constant reminder for WWE who has extreme interest in me. Okay, we're going to need to make him a serious offer that he can't refuse. How do you know they have extreme interest in you? Again, I know for a fact, it's already been leaked several times. And even if it wasn't leaked, I would have known. But legally, I cannot discuss why. What happens if Tony Khan comes up to you, let's say... June of 2023. Hey, let's figure this out. Let's get this done. I'm not Are signing you... shit. I'm not signing shit. No, you're going to, you no want to test the waters. Uh, it, it's, it's not a test. If, if you know, you're going to win, I got the cheat code. I got the answers on a, on a piece of paper, you know, 
Um, so, so no, that's, that is not something I consider unless, unless the number was absolutely astronomical, but even then I'm not sure I'd consider it. What's, what's a, what's a number that you would consider? That's not something that I'm willing to discuss, but I'm sure if you see what the top guys in our industry make, that's, that's cool. I want to make more than that. Is there a part of you that feels a sense of loyalty because he took a chance on you? Does, does that give him a bit of an edge? Like I said, mama didn't raise no punk. Uh, although mama herself is a punk, but that's a different story. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, look, this isn't friend business, right? What is it called? Ariel show business. show business. There you go. Is there a part of you because you grew up a W? That was your first introduction to this. Uh, my first love. That was my first yeah. love of professional wrestling. Sure. I mean, will will it feel somewhat? Uh, I don't know. Empty, disappointing. If at some point in your life you don't get to see what no. it is like over there. No, absolutely not. Like I said, I was a child, right? Now I'm not a wrestling fan anymore. I'm a I'm a professional wrestler. Keyword professional. And my whole deal is, I can't look at it that way. I can't go, oh boy, I, I hope I get to do WrestleMania. Oh boy, I, 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 I hope uh, I get to, you know, main event in a pay-per-view. None of that stuff means anything to me. All I care about is the bottom line. And right now, to me, the most important thing is winning that AEW world title. Not because, uh, oh boy, who else has won this? Look at the lineage. I could give a shit. Because if I win that world title, what does that mean, Ariel? It means that you have to pay me more money. And that means that when I win, I get a bigger bonus because it's a championship defense. This is the stuff that people forget about. People don't understand that there are winner's purses in professional wrestling. If you win, you make more money. If you lose, you make less money. That's, that's why we're wrestling. We're not wrestling for a sense of pride. And if anybody tries to tell you that's the case, they're full of shit. I don't wrestle because I love professional wrestling. I wrestle because it makes me money. And that's why I want to be the AEW world champion. And that's why the fact that Cody Rhodes um, is going over there, that's great. Good for him. Um, but I wouldn't leave there because of anything else but money. I would not leave where I'm at right now because of anything else mm -hmm. but money. I asked you if you were surprised he's leaving AEW, Cody. Uh, would you be surprised if he went back? I mean, all signs point to him going back. It seems no, like a, a complete... that's what professional wrestling is. And I wouldn't be surprised if anybody that you were upset that got or offended that got fired from WWE, as I'm sure they were upset too, I wouldn't be shocked if they got rehired. Right. This is professional wrestling. This is pro sports. We move around. We move around. That's that's just the nature of the beast. Has Tony tried to lock you up recently before you get too big? I'm not going to get into that, but I'm sure you can imagine that Tony Khan is a billionaire. Tony Khan is a very intelligent man. Tony Khan's doing everything he can to make sure that his heaviest hitter is sticking around. Did so. you like the AEW product or do you like the AEW product more so now that Tony is kind of the booker? He, he took everything in house, right? At some point it was like this committee. I think, I think Tony Khan, he gets all the credit in the world for what he's doing and he should because he is ridiculously intelligent. Um, the way he decides to showcase his talent and the matchmaking he decides to do is, I mean, it's pretty much perfect. I, there is a reason why within the span of three years, we have created some of the newest and biggest stars that pro wrestling has seen in decades. And it's because Tony Khan is a very bright, intelligent man. And he knows, he knows how to use his chess pieces. And don't get me wrong. That's what pro wrestlers are. We're pieces on a board. The question is, what are you? Are you a pawn or are you a king? Now I'm a king, so you better give me king money. But yes, Tony Khan is a very, very intelligent man. There's a reason he's won Booker of the Year. It's two, two years in a row now, I believe, or is it three? Um, I, I mean, according to who? Yeah, whatever. According, according, I mean, he's won several awards, um, and I believe it's very obvious that the fans, um, our fans are rabid. Our fans love the product. I know you love the product. I know you watch the product. Because what we're bringing to the table, it's fresh, it's intelligent, it doesn't, it doesn't defy logic. Everything that we do makes sense. And everything that I do definitely makes sense. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with Tony Khan and his presence in the company. The more real pro wrestling is, the better yeah. it is. 
Um, that's why I love MMA, right? Because I, I actually felt in the early 2000s that pro wrestling was getting to be too predictable. And he's mm. like, you know what has happened, this, that. And what really turned me off, and I think we're kindred spirits here, um, I grew up in a time where the finishing move was the finishing move. Yeah, uh, Hogan hits a leg drop, it's over. It's yeah. not, let me hit nine of these, and then it's over. And yeah. and something that really pissed me off, remember when Ronda Rousey, if, if I may just stand on this soapbox, Go right ahead. share this with you. Uh, Ronda Rousey had the... Um, privilege of coming over from MMA with a finishing maneuver that was already quote unquote over, right? How many people come over to pro wrestling and your move is already over? The fans know that when you hit this thing, sure. it's lights out. She had the arm bar, right? From yeah. actually submitting people in multiple UFC fights. And what happens in her WWE debut, with all due respect, a you know, a mother of three who's a CEO of the company kicks out of it like nine times. So right sure. then it should have been, you hit that thing, it's lights out. Now you could build up to it and she so scrambles and she gets. Shouldn't Rhonda have hit her harder? Well, I'm just saying. What do you mean? Shouldn't Rhonda have hit her harder to ensure that she would have won the match? Okay. That's on Rhonda, right? Well. She clearly didn't I, train hard enough. Point is. Okay these quote unquote spot fests, not your thing, right? Do you feel like this is hurting pro wrestling? These, these nine times now. So, so wrestling fans think they're smart and they think they're in the know. You're not, I know you're watching this right now. You're not, Are you, you talking don't know to me? shit. <laughs> I'm, I'm, no, no, no. Well, yes, you too, but it's fine. Here's the deal. People want to say spots, whatever. This shit's real to me. Okay. It's because it is real. And here's the deal. When I see dudes running the ropes, spamming moves, it's because in all reality, in the confines of the fight, they're not trying to win, are they? They're just trying to be cool. Correct or incorrect, Ariel? Correct. Everything I do in a match is to win. And that's why my matches evoke emotion, real, legitimate emotion. People go home after they go to an AEW event. They put their head on the pillow and they're mumbling themselves, God damn it, that MJF, what a piece of shit. Are they doing that with anybody else? No. Because they don't believe anybody else because everybody else is trying to spam moves and trying to look cool, right? That's not my job. You hate me? You hate me watching this interview? Good. Cool. That means you feel something. And I come through the screen and I grab you by the fucking face. That's what I do. And that's why I don't like a lot of the modern era of professional wrestling. I don't like watching 30 crash and burn car wreck bullshit just for the sake of a pop. I'm not in it for the pop. I'm in it to win. And the byproduct of that is making you, the viewer, emotionally invested. Now, again, we're going to go back to money because that's all I give a shit about. If you're emotionally invested, what are you going to do? Ariel, what are you going to do? Watch, then pay for the pay-per-view. Damn fucking straight. And that's why I make money for my company and any company that I'd work for. Uh, Moves don't make money. Moves I'm just going to take a money. couple more minutes of your time, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm, is, I'm getting annoyed, but okay, what's up? Yeah, I, uh, I'm enjoying this tremendously. And I, I, you know, I, I've watched a lot of interviews with you where it feels like the interviewer is like trying to outwit you. This True. is your... I mean, this yeah. is your thing, you know. I appreciate you not trying because A, everybody fails. Right. And B, it's it's cringy, right? It's just mm. awkward, you, you know? Said it. Yeah. yeah, it is what it is. How Past interviewers that are watching this interview, I hope you realize you're a schmuck. But continue, Ariel. You uh, have been called like a low-rent Miz. How do you feel about that <laughs> when people compare you to Miz? So it's really funny. So that was – so before Miz, it was EC3. And before EC3 – I think it was Jericho just because of the scarf. So it went Jericho, EC3, Miz, um, at points, Baron Corbin, which I thought was funny because he's over six feet tall and he's a mastodon of a man. I think it's funny now because I don't get, that doesn't happen anymore. Like I look for it because I am a nut. So I'll, I used to do this. I used to type in MJF Miz, right? I don't, I don't see it anymore. And I think it's because I have proven myself at such a level. Now, when I type in MJF, I'm the one that people are getting compared to. And I think that's really funny. 
I'll go online and people will say, oh, Matt Cardona is trying to be MJF. Oh, such and such heel is trying to be MJF. I think it just comes down to who's at the pinnacle, pun intended, who's at the Mecca. Because the guy who's at the Mecca is going to be getting the comparisons with everybody else because you're going to compare the greatest, right? The reason that we compare LeBron James to Michael Jordan is because why? Michael Jordan was the best. So, and that's me giving a huge, huge, huge congratulatory, you know, to to the Miz. Because for the longest time, he was one of the guys that did what? Made you feel something. So I understand why that happened. It's not happening anymore because now I'm head and shoulders above the rest. I respect Miz like no other. I don't know if you've seen this, but Miz complimented me very highly Uh, in an interview. I complimented him very highly back because he's incredible. But we are no longer getting compared. And I appreciate that because that means that I gave people no choice but to uncross their arms, go on their keyboards and write, fuck, I don't like MJF, but he's damn good. So Uh, you got a shout out in the New York Times uh, a year and a half or so ago, which is tremendous for your 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 song and dance with Jericho. Oh, my God. It was it was it was really impressive and pretty damn cool that the Times gave you that shout out. Uh, how long did it take you guys to actually put that together? What do you mean? Well, I mean, I mean the the choreography, the dude. It was, it was it was it was a shoot. It was a one and done. During the moment, I mean, it's fantastic. It is, I really appreciate that, you know. Yeah. And Jericho, as I'm sure people know, I am not the biggest fan. Although this incarnation of Chris, I'm digging. No, mm. I'm not saying we're going to be friendly anytime soon. I beat that pansy like three times but he uh he's doing something interesting he's gotten himself in great shape um but yeah i mean that dinner debonair thing it was incredible i was able to sneak my way into the inner circle and i sucked its life force out from within and as you can tell i did it very successfully because the pinnacle is still together but the inner circle not so much so once again another dub for mjf uh, do you have aspirations at some point, like some of the other greats, Rock, Cena, to transfer over into Hollywood? Bingo, yes. That's why me and Dip are in talks. Um, hmm. Dipperstein, Brian Dipperstein, who is exclusive? an incredible agent. Um, what's that? Is this an exclusive? This is an exclusive. Brian Dipperstein at ICM is my agent. Wow. Um, and we've created a great team. I'm also with Activist, who is my management team. Uh, John Kanak, shout out to him. Justin DeAnda. Uh, Bernie Cahill. And uh, I got a great team and I've had a lot of offers for a lot of different things. I'm in a lot of talks with a lot of different people. That part legally, I will not discuss. I have already done a voiceover for an animated movie that I cannot discuss, but that'll be coming out in 2023. Um, And I'm excited. I mean, quite frankly, when people think about professional wrestlers and acting, they, they, you get nervous and queasy, right? Because most professional wrestlers cannot act. You know, you put a red light in their face and their best thing that they can do is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick your ass, I'm gonna, you know, but that's not my MO. I'm a bright guy. And just like John Cena is a very bright guy, just like The Rock's a very bright guy, just like Batista is a very bright guy. And that's why I feel I bring something entirely different to the table. I am a huge, huge, huge fan of Don Rickles. Do you remember Don Rickles? Of course. The cool thing about Don Rickles was he could walk into a room, he could talk to anybody any which way he liked. And the people loved it. And I feel that that's something I can bring to the table. I could be a, again, hate this word, heel in Hollywood. And it's very exciting. Uh, Is there an age? Is there a cutoff in your mind? I don't want to work past, in terms of wrestling, past this date. I don't want to be wrestling at 45. Have you thought of that? I've absolutely thought of it. It's an age I'm not willing to give out right now at the tender age of 26. But yes, I've absolutely thought of a cutoff. Why, why, Why won't you give it out? Because... I feel, A, that can kill your biz, right? So for example, let's say I, I sat here at 26 and I say, I want to be out of the business at 30, which is not the case. Well, let's say that was the case. Are they going to be willing to give me a butt ton of fucking money if they're only going to be able to have me for an X amount of years? Again, Ariel, business. That's all I care about. 24-7, business. Some people might say, oh, you want to let the world know you only got four years left of me, so appreciate me while you can. Sure. Not if you're trying to make a fat, fat, fat stack of dough. So, Do you have a dream opponent before it's all said and done? You'd love to work with this guy? No. 
Honestly, no. I, I feel I've had incredible matches with the likes of Chris Jericho, CM Punk. Um, I mean, the, the list is wide as far as top stars and top acts. And now I'm a top star and top act, and I'm in the position to give people a rub, if you will. I firmly am of the belief that the reason that that traitor Wardlow turned on me is because he understands that the MJF rub is massive, massive. If he gets an opportunity to get in the ring with me, which he won't, he's under contract with me, but that's a different story for a different day. That would be the biggest rub quite possibly he could have in all of AEW. So now I'm in the position where people want to have matches with me. And that's a pretty damn good spot to be in. Are you an MMA fan? Not really. I mean, here's the thing. I follow it enough. Like, I quasi know what's going on. So, like, enough. I follow it enough. Okay. You don't go out of your way to watch the pay-per-views, all that stuff. No, not really. Like, I'll watch people get their shit rocked on Twitter, and I'll be like, oh, that was cool. But I'm not, like, privy to the names and stuff. I enjoy the interviews you have done with professional wrestlers. Um, going Thanks. back to the original one with uh, CM Punk that I was a, a, a big fan of until, again, found out who he was as a human being. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not a big MMA guy, but I will sit down if it's like a quote unquote big match with my friends if they want to go out to some stingy bar and I want to fucking gag myself. But I'll, I'll go because I'm a salt of the earth guy and I'm trying to be nice. Do you watch the WWE pay-per-views? All of them. And they're not oh. pay-per-views. They're premium live events, area. <laughs> they're premium live events. If you're going to say it, say it right. Like Premium. you'll watch Mania and all that stuff. Wherever you may be, you are going to be watching. I am constantly watching all the products because I want my finger on the. There's nothing going on in professional wrestling right now at this moment, whether it's the indies or whether it's a televised uh, professional wrestling company that I that I don't watch. I watch everything. Wow. I see everything. I watch everything except New Japan. New Japan sucks. Why? Why I do you have a beef with New Japan? It's just the shit. I don't know. <laughs> like there's there's some guys there that are cool. That like I'd like to like I think the Great Okan's kind of cool, um, but yeah I don't know, not my thing. Goes Two back to the things. Movie thing, but go on, go on, go on. Back to the what move? What thing? The move thing. Like it's just they're just oh, cracking each other in the skull over and over again. Okay, they're okay. Just, they're, they're dummies. Concussions are real, you know. Right. But anyway, go on. Uh, two last things, if I may. Uh, if someone is is just fine, I mean. I don't know who they may be, but if they're stumbling upon this interview and and like what you're saying and like your yeah. vibe. What would you, if they want to be like, I want, I want to see the quintessential MJF match. I want to see his top stuff right off the bat. Like, what's, what's the first match that you would tell someone to go out and watch? Any of the punk matches or my match against Darby. Okay. And I believe it was full gear. I think you watch that, you'll learn how to get people emotionally invested as opposed to how to get them to go, oh, and then not care for a another five minutes until you do the next dumb thing. So, and when the hell are you going to get a chance to actually be the AEW champ? Like, it feels like it's this is a real dude. slow so play. If I, had beaten, if I had beaten Punk, I am fairly certain that I would have moved up very high in the rankings to the point of number one contendership. Um, unfortunately, I did not because he decided to cheat and he had Wardlow hand him a ring, which, by the way, who hits somebody with a ring to win? Yeah, I, I, I mean, the, the amount of disturbed sociopathic energy you must have in your brain to cheat in a, in a, in a sport you're cheating he cheated and we're all just clapping for him it's sickening but yes if i had beaten cm punk i believe i would have been in the number one contendership now personally i have to deal with this whole wardlow issue which will be easy i have this guy under contract you're going to see soon enough how i'm going to handle this schmuck but outside of that after i get that big dumb oaf out of my way it's time for MJF to win that world title and to do what Roddy Piper couldn't do mm. and become champion of the world. Let's go. Uh, last one, July of 2024, where are you wrestling? I believe, I actually don't know. What, is that UBS, the house that MJF built or no? No, it's July of 2024. Okay. So we're now six months oh. removed from when your contract is up. Six months re removed from when my, after my contract is up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay. I'm trying to, Get you to predict something. I'm, I see what you're doing, and I'm trying to avoid the question. Come on, stick with me, MJF. I'm trying right. to put you over here, buddy. Um, I will be wherever the money is. Sorry. Leaning, leaning. I am leaning, but I can't say which way. Wow. But I'm certainly leaning. There, there's a there's a front runner. Oh, there is a front runner. 
Uh, I'm not quite sure it's the one people would expect, but yes, there is a front runner. That is a tease. That is perfect. I mean, there's nothing I like more than a good, you know, free agent chase. There's nothing sure. more exciting than that. So I say sure. we build this up. I think we did that a little bit. I think of that. we did that. I think we did this that. This was an here. absolute pleasure. This was a real pleasure. I wish I could say the same thing. Is it over? Can I leave now? It is over. It is over. I just want to thank you. I want to wish you all the best. Continued success. MJF. Hey! Pull the limo around. I'm out of here. There he is. One of the faces of AEW. Appreciate his time. Go watch him. On no, Wednesday yeah, we're night. done. The interview sucked. TBS, Friday nights, TNT. I mean, that guy was such a nerd. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Ariel Hawani Show. If you want to check out some of our old episodes or if you want to stay up to date with all the great things that we are doing here, please do like and subscribe to this year page. Trust me, some really cool things are coming up.